And welcome to our <clears throat> next in the series seminars of Invest in Tomorrow. My name is Philip Smith, and I'm delighted to be your host this morning as we walk through the next hour. For those dialing in online, we're operating a hybrid event this morning. So I'm delighted to say that we've got about 80 people in the room here in Jersey, and we have upwards of four or 500 people dialing in to listen online to us. We will have to operate a little bit uh, uh, formally because we need to make sure that people can engage online. So let me just talk you through a little bit about how we're going to proceed this morning. We've got four people that are joining me on the stage to talk uh, today. First of all, we have our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is Marga Hook. I'm not sure if we're going to see Marga online at the stage, but Marga is an internationally renowned speaker and author, advising and working with ministers, governments, and politicians. She's also a global voice for G20, for G7, and most recently for COP26. Martha's recent book, The Trillion Dollar uh, the Trillion Dollar Shift, is actually on the chair, so we're providing that as a gift to everybody who's in the room. And for everybody joining virtually, we will be sending to you afterwards a copy by PDF of PDF, sorry, of her book for your reading. Joining me also, we have Dr. Emiko Carly Smith sitting down at the front, uh, who is known in Jersey, the CEO of Kit Consulting who helps businesses transform into sustainable, climate-resilient organizations. I'm also going to be joined by Mabali Makatini. She is the head of our ESG strategy at Standard Bank within our Melville Douglas investment management business. She'll be joining virtually. And I'm also being joined by James Hibbs. James Hibbs is a portfolio manager within Standard Bank here in Jersey and is responsible for our ESG portfolios and responsible offering. So the order of events is, first of all, we'll be hearing from Marga for about 30, 35 minutes as she talks to us about the SDGs, ESG, and how businesses need to transform. We'll then move into a small panel discussion for 10 or 15 minutes, where I'll be posing three or four questions to the panelists joining me. We'll then open up the floor for a bit of Q&A, both in the room and online. For those people joining online, please do find the Q&A functionality on BlueJeans, Submit your questions. We'll be able to take some, perhaps not all. But what we will commit to doing is making sure at the end of the event, we follow up on all the questions posed. We'll send those back to everybody by email so that you get full responses from us. Africa means business. It's not just somewhere to invest. It's where we live, work, and build for the future. It's a beautiful continent whose resources need to be protected in order for her to grow. We believe that when you do business the right way, it can be as good for profitability as it is for sustainability. Which is why we're seeking businesses that align to our ambitions of promoting African growth through positive change. We're here for people, here for business, here for dreams. The kind of dreams that turn a signature on a dotted line into power for a classroom. Marking the beginnings of a blueprint for eco-friendly student housing. We're driving sustainable growth across the continent. Not just because it's smart business, but because it cultivates the place that we call home too. Because to us, it's the human story that matters just as much as the business story. And if we write it together, the world will read of our success. Standard Bank. It can be. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you Marga Hook. Marga is dialing in from the Netherlands today. So we're very pleased to have you with you. And the floor is over to you, Marga. Thank you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. And uh, I enjoyed the beautiful video in the beginning, which said quite some meaningful things, as I will touch upon in the coming half hour. It's a huge pleasure to be uh, with you today and to talk about something so important as how do we transform business in such a way that we actually improve the world by the way we do business. And let me start on a positive note. 
And that is that, of course, we have some years behind us with huge crisis, with the pandemic hitting us everywhere in the world. And let me touch upon the fact that in the poorest parts of the world, and Africa is a huge part of that, uh, the hardest. But also it brought a good thing. We have learned, it has taught us, and what it has taught us is that actually if humankind radically changes their behavior, read the way we invest, that we can actually also radically improve the world. And that notion has been demonstrated because, of course, we were all forced to in action, shutting down factories, supply chains, no traveling, and we saw that literally the world recuperated in very little time in terms of rivers, skies in cities, and so forth. But also it proved to us that ESG investing, sustainable companies and in investing, outperformed, demonstrated more resilience, and hence were a good solution um, as a business and to investing. And this led to the continuation and even further steepening of a huge global growth of ESG assets, what we will be talking about later on in this morning. Um, it has been predicted by now that around 2025, it will be as much as one third of all assets under management in the world that could be labeled as sustainable and ESG. Now imagine that that was only around 30, around 2018. So that's a huge growth. And being called by now a perfect storm, which is a bit of a cynical sentence, you could say, but it's a huge wave of growth and we'll see much more of that growth the next years to come. Currently, the EU is, you know, the trend shaper of ESG in investing. Uh, it has almost half of all the ESG assets, but we see steep growth in the US and also Asia and specifically Japan coming up. So said that the EU is actually the barometer of the growth in the rest of the world to follow. So huge growth also ahead of us. Does that mean by now that we have actually solved the problems that uh, we supposed to address with sustainable investing? Well, not yet, not really, actually, but there's hope. If you look at the year 2015, something very major happened. In that year, 193 countries adopted what we call the Sustainable Development Goals. And I just learned that you all have my book. Please refrain from reading in it right now, but uh, you can read a lot more about these Sustainable Development Goals in that book. You could say, following the millennial goals that preceded them, that these 17 goals represent the new definition of sustainability, because they represent everything in the world that should be solved by the year 2030 to have a sustainable world and economy, because of course those two things are intertwined, meaning that we should solve huge poverty, hunger, that we should switch to renewable energy and beat climate change up to 1.252 degrees, that we should make sure that people have equal chances of good health and well-being, that we beat inequality, that we make sure that consumption and production gets more sustainable, and so forth. Every year <clears throat> since 2015 that we agreed on these sustainable um, development goals, countries measure themselves against those goals. More and more countries do that actually voluntarily. And you can imagine it's a huge data exercise, but it shows us progress around the world. And here's one important notion, wherever you are in the world, climate change doesn't fly over you. So problems in one place of the world touch other places in the world as well. Hunger in one place is problems in another, climate change in one place or um, nature disasters in one place touches climate change in others. So it's one set of challenges we have to solve. Now, following the pandemic, we had a plateau and even a decrease 
in progress on the SDGs. Uh, actually, that was a huge hit, especially in developing countries, obviously. And if you look at the challenges today, uh, I would like to run a couple of examples by you without wanting to depress you, but just a touch of reality. Currently, one in four people has no access to fresh drinking water. One in four around the globe. Three out of ten people during the pandemic could actually not wash their hands with fresh water and soap as it was advised. Almost half the people around the world, around 45%, actually still is not digitally connected. So all those digital solutions we have actually don't reach currently 45% of our global planet. 750 million people still have no access to electricity, which is of course crucial also, given the need for climate change. And three out of four people lack access to electricity in sub-Sahara Africa. So huge challenges. Only 29% of global energy is actually renewable by now. If you talk about resources, which is of course also a challenge, 9% uh, of plastics is only being recycled currently. Nine. And if you look at plastic soup, which is a result of all the plastics ending up in rivers that in the end end up in oceans, we have the size of three times France as a plastic soup currently. I could go on and on and on about all those challenges, but it means that only taking away risks for our own assets doesn't really solve the problem. We really have to have impact on the ground to change things radically. Now, you probably have heard about the SDGs and I want to make a brief notion that actually SDGs and ESGs are not two completely different things because ESG touches upon several parts of the SDGs and you can group them in different ways. Um, that is not the most important thing. Most important is that if you touch upon every ESG topic, you will also do so at the SDGs. And just to run it briefly for those who are not working with ESG every day, environmental topics is about CO2, about um, all kinds of air pollution, water pollution, use of resources, and of course, currently lack of recycling of those. Social challenges about diversity and inclusion, well-being, poverty, gender diversity, other forms of diversity and inclusion, and governance about lawsuits, bribery, the split between chairman and CEO, so the governance of companies, uh, board compositions and board pay are a couple of examples. Now, environmental ecological topics were the most inside for a long time. But re more recently, we saw that social aspects are equally important and that we, if we do the E and the S very well, but we have a problem of governance, then our reputation is thrown away as well. And we also more and more realize is that having an impact either for good or for bad on environmental topics has an impact on social topics and governance and the other way around. So they're actually intertwined and cannot be seen as separate topics. Now, I mentioned the growth just now, and of course we'll see later that it's a result of opportunities, but it's also a result of risks. And more and more, and for instance, you see that at the top risks when they are discussed at World Economic Forum every year, um, ESG topics are at the top of the list and currently eight out of the 10 most impactful risks are actually ESG related. Here you see an image, is just an example about climate change consequences in terms of uh, weather and climate disasters. And imagine that for instance, in 2017, the impact, financial impact of the disasters back then, this image is by the way of 2020, equals 35% of 50 years until 2019. So there's such a 
a steep growth in disasters, their human impact, of course, but also their economical impact. And to give you a notion, in 2021, we had $21 billion crisis in one year. So ESG is now considered a huge risk if you don't integrate it in your company or in your investments. And that leads to a huge trend to want to include ESG risks in investments. And companies are forced to do so in their company leadership as to mitigate all those risks. And that's actually a great shift because not that long ago, it was not really considered a big risk, but now it's at the top ranks. Now, as I said, it's very important, of course, to protect your assets to the ESG risks. You want to be hit by stranded assets or by huge costs or by a, comp a company that cannot operate anymore because of those risks and it didn't protect itself from it. But there's also another side to this story, and that's the opportunity side. And with the Global Business Commission, we actually researched, uh, which was a vast endeavor, how big are the opportunities and not only how big are the risks. And we found that actually related to the global goals, there was a huge price of $12 trillion in new business opportunities of companies that actively engage with the SDGs in the sense that not only they mitigate their negative impact, but enhance their positive impact. You could say be part of the solution rather than the problem. And by now you should realize that business is, you could say, the biggest power on earth. If you look, for instance, at the 100 largest economies by revenue in the world, 100 largest economies by revenue, 69 of those are companies and not countries. 69 of the 100. That's huge. But huge power comes with huge responsibility because huge power means huge impact for good and for bad. But Having said that, huge business opportunities, and we also studied in which area do they take place, and those are predominantly in and around cities. The majority of people will live there, so you can imagine a lot of business solutions are needed around food and agriculture. We need a lot more healthy food. About health and well-being, we have to get health prevention. Obesitas, for instance, is around 3.8% of global GDP. That is going to that, and energy resources. Those are domains that are very, very interesting. And a lot of new market potential is to be unlocked by companies who look at sustainability as an opportunity, who see that sustainability and profitability are mutual connected and not mutually exclusive. So this, as a result, both the risk side and the opportunity side leads for companies and especially front-running companies to a race to net zero, meaning companies know that they have to have a net zero impact, not only because governments say so, not only because the SDGs or the Climate Agreement of Paris says so, but they know they have to do it to mitigate risks and to be future-proof because there won't be a place for companies that have a huge CO2 impact in the future. But not only to the net zero, we also see that companies more and more want to have a net positive impact and that they see the zero line as a starter point rather than a result. Now, later on, you'll talk a lot about investments and portfolios and measurement and all that. So I wanted to take the opportunity to briefly touch upon a couple of examples of companies. So Orsted is a Danish company. Before it was called Dong Energy and it was oil and gas. Orsted early on, um, a non-listed company by the way, saw that they had to go to zero carbon and they had to shift to renewable energy sources and had to do it rapidly to actually achieve a competitive advantage. And so it did so, and following bold 
statements and bold objectives they did so earlier on for their operations. Now, important for you to know if you invest in companies is that it's not only important to have a carbon neutral operations, so what the company does itself, but that the whole supply chain, and preferably, of course, the entire life cycle, is decarbonized. And Orsted is uh, currently on a journey to do so rapidly. And you see that with a lot more companies, and it's very, very important to look at that companies don't only measure their own operations, but they go and do so for their whole supply chain and life cycle. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, otherwise we don't really solve the problem. Now you see companies that uh, really create value by achieving positive impact. And that means net positive impact that actually the world is better off by your company growing because your company gives more back more than it takes. And this is an interesting example of a French um, combination of companies that build energy positive houses. Uh, so they don't say we apply to law and legislation and we, we, we reduce CO2 or we go to net zero. No, they go beyond, which is possible because the technology is there. And here you see the combination of ecological and social aspects. They do so because that way they can provide affordable living and mitigate risks, not only for their own assets, but also for the tenants or the buyers of the apartments because they simply don't have energy costs. And you can imagine with the current situation that that's a huge risk mitigator and cost reduction for people. I don't have to tell you that businesses like this thrive and that they have huge growth opportunities because they developed the technology. The only thing they need to do actually is further scale up. Those are interesting companies to invest in. There's a lot of examples like that around the world. And what you see by now, whilst we enter the fourth industrial revolution, and we have a lot of technologies provided to companies, not only in the tech sector, but in every single sector, like here in the construction sector, that we can achieve much more positive impact much more easily. So this is an example of what we call a smog eating front. It's a German technology that literally absorbs the pollution from the air of around 8,000 cars per day. Uh, this is a picture of a building in uh, Mexico called the La Torre La Especialidades. It's a smog eating front in front of a hospital. Those kinds of solutions have huge growth opportunities. Of course, if you look at the investment spectrum, it's still the minority and it takes positive investing. These are not listed companies, but we need sustainable investment throughout all asset classes. Another example is Interface, a, an American listed company that also went on the mission zero, reached it and then said, now we want to go beyond and have positive impact. And they do so in multiple ways. Now, one notion that is important um, to say about this and this is a company that actually buys all the fishermen's nets that are broken in Philippines and other countries and turn them into resources for their carpets, paying out a fair wage to those fishermen. So creating economical and social value in the areas where they operate. It's also important to know that companies like this have a story to tell to clients, build a reputation which is very strong, and if you realize that by now sustainable brands, and for instance, Unilever investigated that, grow 1.6 times faster than non-sustainable brands, and brands that really market it as sustainable even double that impact, meaning that it's actually good business. Hence the title of my book, Business for Good, is good business. Those companies do really well. They attract people. People want to work there. They attract clients and they grow and have a high um, agility because they're so innovative. Now, these are just a couple of examples of companies that do well. And of course, there are many, many more. And the trends they said are followed by a lot of other companies. And the trend is to not only mitigate the risk, but to seize opportunities to create positive impact, to create real value. As a consequence, of the grown risks and eye on opportunities, corporate boards are facing huge pressure by now. 
And this change came about really rapidly. You can probably remember that only a couple of years ago, um, CEOs and chairmen were challenged not to do too much about sustainability, but not forget the short-term um, um, share price raise for the shareholders. And they were actually pulled back. And now we see the reverse development, like for instance at ExxonMobil and Shell, no doubt you've seen, that actually board members were replaced because were taken out because they didn't adapt to climate change and didn't incorporate an effective strategy and went too slow. So now corporate boards are facing the other pressure. They face pressure from multiple stakeholders, from governments and from legislation, on disclosure, on measurement, on complying. They face pressure from investors, but also from clients, and they are faced with a change of competencies needs on non-executive and executive boards. Uh, this is going very rapidly. They now need to know about these things, need to know how to measure and how to materialize and disclose. So that's a huge change for boards right now. And there's more to come because currently we only think about the current generations, but no doubt you've heard that Generation Z and millennials are soon taking out over the majority of the marketplace and also the employees. And they are different. They are very much more progressive. It's been researched that two thirds of next generation consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable products Eight out of 10 wants to work for a sustainable company and they want to invest. And it's being said that they, in that sense, that millennials and Generation Z vote with their wallets. So if you think about sustainable and ESG investing, the market for that will substantially grow in the years to come. Is it hot and, and, and steeply growing now? you will see much more of that in the near future. And here are some numbers about millennials. And of course, the generation Z is right behind that. So that won't go down. But there's a risk to all of this because there's huge growth. We now know that sustainable brands grow faster, that there's a huge markets to be opened. And most business people know this. So you see a lot of greenwashing out there. And if you invest, uh, it's important to be able to distinguish the green from the supposedly green. And this is not so easy. Uh, probably Standard Bank will talk about how they deal with this. Because it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of true materializing and transparency to know what is true and what is not. And let me give you an example. If you look at um, funds that are labeled as ethical, sustainable, and even climate-related funds, the sustainable branded funds, 70% of them, over 70% of them, actually is not in agreement with the targets of the Climate Agreement of Paris. They're beneath it. If you look at climate-related funds, and that call themselves as such, around 50% of them equally is not in line with the targets of the Paris Agreement. And some of them still even invest in uh, fossil energy companies. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, it's a current dilemma for investors to exclude or to engage. And as you have seen, for instance, with ExxonMobil, engaging and activism can be very effective if done collaboratively and if done with impact. And if done with concrete targets, you can really shift the needle. So it's not only exclusion we need. We also need to engage with companies, forcing them a little bit or accelerating them to go in the right direction. But it's important to know what is right and wrong and don't get yourself something sold green, whereas it actually isn't. Because that won't change the world as we need it. Now, last but definitely not least, and I think um, the next speakers will talk about that, it's show me the data. So only saying something is sustainable or ESG 
is not enough. We need to see this materialized, we see it measured, we see it reported, and companies are forced to disclose their impact, which is very important. And we need a total investment value chain for that. Every party has to do their thing. Data is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, it's not. It's very much easier said than done, uh, but we need it. And we need it for not only operational impact, like I said, but through the whole supply chain and life cycle. So a lot to be done, but a lot is also happening at Dada and all the technologies that are there available to us really help with that. Finally, we can talk what we want, we can say things are difficult, but we need to get it done because in the end we're all on the same planet. Um, there's a huge task for all of us. Capital is really steering the world. You can't have more impact than with capital. And I hope that you really want to, like I said in the slide with the millennials, vote with your wallet, because we actually need all the capital there is. Imagine to achieve the sustainable development goals, we need three to five trillion dollars a year. That is the GDP of Germany, of Japan, every year till 2030. So de-risking to protect your assets is not enough. We need products throughout all asset classes that really help solve the problem by capital. I mentioned in the beginning, we have seen sustainable ESG investments outperform. So the cost orientation saying we'll do it only with as little of a possible cost is not relevant anymore. It is a good business case. You can safely invest sustainably, you won't lose money over it. It's the biggest opportunity of all times. And um, I hope Standard Bank will provide a lot of products and services to help you make good decisions on that. If you want to read more, you've got that book. Don't get frightened, it's quite thick, but that's because you can browse through and have a look at the topics that are really of your interest. I hope I inspired you this morning with some insights and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Margot. That, that was insightful, if not a little bit scary. You know, I've certainly got a couple of Gen Zs living in my house. Their sustainability seems to be to stay there for as long as they can. So I'm sure we, we, we all probably have the, the same challenge. I think we should be thinking a little bit more about product. Um, we're going to move into 10 or 15 minutes now, just uh, talking to some of our panelists, posing a few questions about some of the, um, the, the key topics that were raised there by Marga. I mean, if, if I think even back to three years ago, if you had the conversation with a customer about investing, you know, their, their first question used to be, well, why? Why ESG? You know, the, the conversation now is completely flipped. It's why isn't it ESG? Everything is very much more focused towards that. I was looking at some statistics recently and I noticed that if you just look at ETFs, so exchange traded funds, people getting easy access to ESG investments. If we go back to 2006, there was $6 billion invested in, that fund, in those funds. If we fast forward to 2019, that $6 billion had become $89 billion. 89 is a big number, but between 2019 and 2021, that 89 went to 290 billion. That is the way that the whole shift is changing. Can I invite Dr. Emiko to come and join me? Um, we're, we're, we're overburdened for chairs. I don't know where you'd like to sit or stand. Why, why don't you do that, please? So let's welcome Dr. Emiko, please. So I think, you know, if, if I understand correctly, you spend a lot of time advising corporates about being sustainable. One of the comments that we had from Marga was around data. 
So, so can we perhaps touch on data? What, what are organizations doing from a data point of view to actually be more transparent? How, how is that being fed back into the investor world, in your opinion? Yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for inviting me to speak today. I've just got about five minutes to talk to you about the um, investor sentiment and behaviour and how that's changed over the last few years and then also the need for data to enable those investors to make the right decisions from an ESG perspective. Um, so for, from a data perspective, just to answer the initial question, I think that is the thing that we need to crack as a result of COP26. You will have heard that the COP26 26 uh, meeting resulted in the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Now that's bringing together the um, International Financial Reporting Council Foundation, as well as the um, Sustainability uh, Standards Board, SASAB and um, IIRC. Hopefully together they will create some global sustainability standards that all companies can report against, which will make it easier for investors to be able to make the right investment decisions from an ESG perspective. But why is that important? Well, because as investors, institutional and individual, we have all developed a growing appetite for positive environmental and social impact investments. Um, COVID definitely has played its part, but also a growing body of regulation and the outcomes of uh, meetings such as COP26 have all prompted us into putting that nearly 50 trillion US dollars into sustainable assets. It's also resulted in the issuance of 5 uh, trillion of sustainable debt over the last year, which is a growing market for investors. And across all asset classes, investors need to understand whether their environmental and social investments are actually going to be positively impactful. And in order to do that, the need for data through organisations such as this new ISSB um, is, is ever growing and more important. At the moment, it's very difficult to compare the ESG performance of different investments because there is no common standard. I just wanted to pick up on something that Marga talked about earlier, and that was around uh, millennial sentiment. So investors in all generations are now interested in ESG. There was some recent research by LGIM, Legal and General Investment Management, that showed that there were intergenerational differences in what was important. So millennials and uh, Gen Y seem to be favouring climate change, which speaks to a lot of the regulation and the, uh, the focus that we're seeing from meeting such as COP26 on climate adaptation, that's SDG number 13 on climate change and climate action. But older generations are prioritising the social and governance aspects of ESG, so playing into those other SDGs that Marga was talking about earlier. The baby boomer generation particularly is prioritising governance, um, and then the silent generation is very interested in social well-being. So it's really important that we as uh, financial service providers are appealing to all of those generations, not just to millennials and not just to Gen Z, who are particularly interested in climate adaptation. Another result of COP26 was the, um, as well as the formation of this new International Sustainability Standards Board, um, was the pledge for countries to um, channel capital into de developing, developed countries to channel capital into developing countries for climate adaptation. So that will present some opportunities for investors as well. And again, data is required to understand the impact that the channeling of that capital is going to have in those developing countries, such as African nations. And then finally, um, one of the large things coming out of COP26 is uh, the need for large organisations to publish net zero transition plans. So we, we heard from Marga about net zero and the need to become climate positive. There will be regulation coming that will insist that large organisations publish their transition plans to net zero. And again, that kind of data, those published transition plans will help investors make decisions about which organisations are, are um, going to be more successful in achieving net zero in the timeframes that they set out. I hope everybody's thinking of some, some suitable questions. As I said before, if we can't answer them today while we're talking, we will certainly come back to you. So please do do that. Okay. But I'll swap with you. I'll sit down there. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jen. Okay, what, what I'd like to do now, please, is to bring up Mbali. 
And Barley, as I said at the beginning, is uh, head of ESG for Standard Bank, particularly on the investment side, based down in Johannesburg. So, and Barley, good morning and welcome. The, gr- the great thing about having fantastic, knowledgeable speakers is that I don't actually have to pose too many questions. You, we just set them off and we hear from their experience. But, but what would be particularly interesting to understand, and Barley, this morning is, you know, what, what's, what, what's our strategy of Standard Bank? So we're talking about investors, we're talking about products and services. You know, how are we tilting, changing our strategy? What are we actually doing going forward? Perhaps you could give us your insight on that, please. Sure. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for mm-hmm. inviting me to the platform. And good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really great question. And as well as maybe to start, Marvel Douglas has an ESG strategy that's based on three fundamental building blocks. Um, And the first is really to use ESG as a risk management framework. Um, The second helps us to become responsible corporate citizens. Um, We obviously want to be responsible investors. We are on a journey to become signatories of the UNPRI. And then the last um, pillar of the the ESG strategy speaks to maybe the question that you've posed. Um, and that's to enable us to be able to look at ESG-related opportunities um, in the market so we can become competitive. Um, and I think that this has required us to engage um, with some of the points that both Marga and Emiko have raised, to understand uh, investor sentiments and expectations, um, not only on companies or projects which we uh, lend or invest, but also, you know, expectations on us. So um, Standard Bank as a financial service provider or Douglas as an asset manager. Um, We've had to, the flows, you know, where do investors want to put their money? Um, Are they concerned about climate change? Are they concerned about biodiversity? Um, You know, we've had to think about what sectors or opportunities are we seeing um, get the most traction? And, you know, what are the best international practice, uh, best practice standards related to these? Um, what are regulatory changes or maybe disclosure uh, requirements? Um, Marga mentioned greenwashing and, you know, that, that's closely related to that. We, and we need to understand um, what um, we have to be in alignment with, um, with respect to uh, taxonomies. So, you know, those are the things that we've had to look at in understanding where we need to go and what we need to implement um, from an ESG perspective to be able to, you know, be in alignment, like you say, and to be competitive. Um, so, yeah, the journey, um, that's the journey that we've been on. And with that in mind, um, we've made some adjustments. In the case of the border standard bank, we a framework that considered what we call C impacts. Um, C impacts are, you know, your social, economic, and in- environmental elements uh, where we've uh, um, created apologies um, that into um, our corporate strategy and day-to-day decisions. And within this framework, we identified seven areas that enable us to um, our core business activities um, to facilitate, I think, you know, the development and the growth uh, while making that substantial positive impact um, on society, on the economy and the environment. Um, these, these seven areas are uh, financial inclusion, uh, job creation and enterprise growth, uh, infrastructure, Africa trade investments, climate change and sustainable finance, um, education and health. Um, All of these areas that I've just mentioned are linked to specific SDGs. And then in addition to that, you know, we've we've really looked at ESG and developed and uh, and looked at ESG uh, risk, which has been integrated into the group's um, uh, enterprise risk management framework. And we have adopted an ESG risk governance framework, which addresses, you know, um, social, environmental and climate related risks. And what we do there is, you know, the identification, classification, analysis, monitoring and reporting. Um, So, yeah, I think those are the main things. And we've also really been engaged with various associations and memberships. Um, You know, we're founding members of uh, UNIPFI, uh, the United Nations Environmental Programme for Financial Institutions. Uh, We're founding members of their Principles for Responsible Banking. Um, We have started reporting on TCFD. Um, We previously chaired on the Equator Principles Association, um, participated in, you know, pilots with uh, the partnership in uh, carbon accounting, financials, PCAV. So there's a lot of things that Standard Bank as the group 
group has really been engaging on to make this the same. And I think on the wealth and investment side, um, Melville Douglas has made equal efforts in alignment. Um, you know, we continue to work on getting um, fundamentals in place. Um, I think I'm, I'm relatively new to Melville Douglas, but I think even just my appointment uh, shows that Melville Douglas understands that, you know, being a responsible investor provides us with a license to operate and, you know, they needed to be a person who, who drives that strategy. Um, we've been working on policies and processes um, in order to integrate ESG into investment and decision making. Um, this has included, you know, incorporating ESG due diligence processes. Uh, we now have exclusions and negative screening. Uh, we have ESG assessments and impact assessments. Um, and yeah, we've 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 also looked at, um, you know, developing governance structures such as an ESG committee. And what that committee really does is provide oversight on the implementation and direction of our strategy, um, you know, ESG integration into research, investments, client engagement and reporting. Um, so yeah, the work hasn't been limited to just, you know, the, the selection or the due diligence side. Uh, we've also been gearing up on ESG related product offerings um, and perhaps James can share more on the responsible diversified portfolios that he hits up uh, from Standard Bank Jersey uh, we also have a global impact fund that's been used as a vehicle to drive investments to companies that have, um, you know, uh, uh, that are, that have a miserable contribution towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, yeah, so I think we're in the early stages of our journey, but I believe that we're making steady progress, and it's it's definitely in alignment with where the world is going, and certainly investor confidence uh, moving forward. Thank you. No, thank, thank, thank you very much indeed. I, I, I hope we don't confuse you because we, we are Standard Bank and we talk about Melville Douglas. So as everybody will be aware, Melville Douglas is the brand name we use for our investment proposition. Uh, we, we've been very conscious that we don't actually lead very strongly with that. We've started certainly in Jersey, now working with various publications to be more out there talking about our brand. So please, if you hear Melville Douglas, think about Standard Bank. With that, let me move over to James Hibbs, please. Can we bring James up on the screen? James is a portfolio manager. James is responsible for our proposition for our private clients and corporate clients. Uh, James is based in Jersey. Good morning to you. Perhaps, James, you could just Tell us a little bit, we've heard from Mabali about the strategy, but what are the actual products and services, James, that we've got? How, how are they constructed? What, what is our offering, please? Sure. Um, thanks, Philip. Morning, everyone. Um, we currently have two distinct solutions within Melville Douglas that Mbali touched on um, that would be aligned to a responsible approach, which we feel is going further than just ESG. Um, firstly, we've got our responsible portfolios. So these are fully discretionary multi-asset portfolios that sit within Melville Douglas Diversified. So that's our multi-manager discretionary offering where we're partnering with quality third-party managers. Um, this solution was created given what we saw um, as an undeniable investment case, which you know has already been articulated by the other uh, panelists, on the back of a long-term structural trend towards living and investing more sustainably and achieving the UN SDGs by 2030. So investor demand was only going to increase, um, and this has been accelerated by recent events. Um, we were also at the point where the number of credible managers and potential investments was of sufficient size to allow us to implement our process, have sufficient diversification, and also crucially, not give up returns. Um, so the, the solution has now been running for over four years. It has three basic aims, really. Um, firstly, to reflect the Melville Douglas diversified investment philosophy and process. So asset allocation is aligned to the wider business, as is the manager selection process. Um, as you would expect, we're aiming to promote environmental and societal good, um, while avoiding companies and industries that cause harm. And thirdly, and importantly, uh, we're looking to do all this without sacrificing long-term performance or taking undue risk for our client. Um, and this last point is important because when it comes to assessing the performance of the portfolios, we are comparing ourselves against unconstrained benchmarks and peer groups. Um, exactly the same ones we use for our unconstrained client portfolios. Um, and when it comes to constructing these portfolios, as I mentioned, we have the, the same asset allocation and management process. But in this case, um, obviously, we're partnering with sustainable and impact managers. And actually, we believe that the way we select managers um, lends itself very well to this space because we very much start with the 
qualitative aspect, i.e. meeting the managers, understanding their philosophy, their processes, rather than starting with a quant screen, um, which, as I say, I feel is important given the lack, really, of quality sustainability data that is available for investors at the moment, and also has already uh, been touched on by Marga, the propensity for greenwashing or using simply responsible or sustainable labels um, for marketing purposes. Um, alongside that, and Bali mentioned the Melbourne Douglas Global Impact Fund. So this is a portfolio of 30 to 40 direct equities, where our in-house equity research team are identifying long-term secular growth themes and leveraging the existing Melville Douglas equity philosophy to identify quality companies that are going to benefit from those trends. Um, so the companies we invest in need to demonstrate they're driving positive impact. And we, we assess that through the lens of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the fund also aims to be aligned with the UN principles for responsible investing. Um, currently, the three main themes that that fund has exposure to and is looking to benefit from are transformational technology, uh, climate change and health and well-being. Thanks. Thanks, James. J James, another example of sustainability. James has COVID, so I think he's done very well to actually be able to still, <laughs> still present, even though he, he's, he's actually in Jersey. C can we now bring up the panellists all on the screen, please? We we'd like to go into some, some questions. If you're going to answer a question in the room, I'll try and take one from the room, take one from the online system. Um, please do wait until a microphone turns up, just so that the benefits or everybody in the audience globally can listen to that, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Um, we've spoken a lot about how business can be a force for change. Um, to what extent should we be worried about the lack of understanding and urgency uh, shown by our governments? Um, the short election cycle seem to be poorly designed. Uh, to, to tackle the long-term existential um, risks. Um, we've seen the UK government recently bemoaning the, the costs of transitioning away from Russian energy to, to green energy, um, you know, just in the last few days. And then locally, you know, the, the, the carbon neutral roadmap um, seems to be poorly focused. For an example, we've got uh, around about £10 million being allocated to the transition to electric vehicles and biodiesel, which might sound quite good. Um, but... Um, there's only 300,000 that's been allocated to active travel solutions. So it seems to be that governments really aren't really uh, fully understanding the, the facts and the science that they're being told all the time. Thank you. Great, great question. Sound a bit governmental, political, policy. Would you like to start with that one? I'm more than happy to. It's great to see your, um, your sust uh, Sustainable Development Goals badge, Simon. Thank you for wearing it. Um, so I, I think actually private sector and private capital has the biggest role to play in the transition to net zero in our adaptation to climate change and in solving all of the sustainable development goals. Government policy will help, of course, and government regulation, I think, will definitely help. But ultimately, it's about how we get the private sector capital from the asset owners through to the ultimate impact. So I'm not trying to not answer the question. I just honestly believe that without that capital, it's all being channeled into the right places, um, we're not going to solve the, the big problems. So if we concentrate more on that as a, as a private sector, as a capital market, I think we will probably get more progress than waiting for the governments to use policy measures to force us into taking climate responsible steps. Thank you. I mean, Margaret, you're obviously close to governments, policies, ministers. What, what would your comments be on that, please? Having the experience of um, working with governments and trying to push them forward, uh, I mean, it's a draining exercise, I can say. Um, by now, um, as was just said, governments, unfortunately, are not a driver of change, uh, but they should be. So it's also easy to say, let's not wait for the government, I agree, but let's push the government to move more is equally needed because in the end, you know, things like our tax system. So for instance, the price of CO2 is still way too low. And that means that sustainable business cases um, perform lower than they should if we incorporate all externalities to uh, use a difficult word. So governments need to move forward much more. They work on, consent, on the basis of consensus, and consensus in itself is a difficult principle if you need to drive change. On the other hand, governments are for the back door. So if companies don't change, they have to be forced by legislation, disclosure rules, taxonomies, and so forth to do so. Uh, and they should help the front runners. So 
uh, no, they're not a real driver of change. They should do more. We're trying our best to move them forward more. And uh, business collectively, and that is uh, a recent change, more or less since we have the sustainable development goals, are more organized in pressuring governments for more progressive change. So I expect more of that uh, towards the future. But I agree, let's not wait for it. Um, companies are the biggest force for good. Uh, on purpose, I mentioned the example of the 10 largest economic entities by revenue being 69 of the 100 companies and not countries. So that is an indication of an enormous power for good, and we should use it as such. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question that's come in <clears throat> online. Uh, James Hibbs, I'm going to pose this one to yourself. So, given that there are no common reporting or measurement standards, how does Melville Douglas make investment decisions? James. Uh, hi, thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, so as I touched on earlier, um, for the responsible portfolios, it really is the, the way we select managers that helps us um, to ensure we're investing our clients' money responsibly. Um, spending time with those managers, ensuring that they uh, truly are sustainable, they have proper sustainable objectives or impact objectives. Um, greenwashing is very prevalent. Um, and so doing it like that and having the experience of selecting managers and that qualitative approach is key. Um, and also when we're picking managers, the ones we're partnering with in those portfolios at the moment, they all have either um, been doing sustainable investing for, for multi-decade or sustainable investing is all they do. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives us the, the comfort and the, and the, um, the benefit of using them um, and gives our clients hopefully comfort that their funds are being invested uh, responsibly because it is definitely a bit of a minefield. And certainly if you're a retail investor um, where you don't have that ability to maybe do the deep dive on, on what you're investing or the managers you're investing in, it can be quite tricky. Um, regulation is coming that will help. Um, so you've got the EU Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation that's already around. Um, that's the EU's aim to tackle greenwashing. Um, at a high level, they'll lay, funds will be labelled Article 6 if they're sustainable, 9 if they're impact, and 6 for the, if they have an ESG process. But even that, though, at the moment, there is um, still problems with that, given that managers are marking their own homework, classifying themselves. And the issues with this were evidenced recently um, when Morningstar actually removed 1,600 funds. So that's equivalent to 1.2 trillion of assets in their sustainable classification, despite those funds self-assessing as sustainable. So investors really need to do the work on any prospective manager. Um, and we obviously, as uh, institutional investors, have the ability to do that for our clients. Thank you. I mean, certainly SFDR regulation, this is all going to start helping, is it having a more of a common reporting standard and benchmark? One, sorry, behind, at the back first of all, and then perhaps come to the front for one final question. Thank you. Sorry, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that you made, Emiko, um, about the role of policymakers. Uh, and you, you mentioned the importance of regulation um, in, in driving change. Um, if we had one regulatory change that we could make here in Jersey to really support the scaling up of sustainable finance, what would that one regulatory change be? Would it be in terms of introducing disclosures? Would it be in terms of labeling, anti-greenwashing? What would it be? Oh, that's a big question. I think that's David. That's a big question for the end of the morning. Um, I, I, do un I do understand why regulators have started with disclosures as the easiest way in to regulate around the disclosure of ESG performance in funds or potentially even at a company level. But I also believe that that regulation isn't going to take things far enough. So even though people are just explaining what they're doing, um, a lot of the regulation around TCFD, for example, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures is sort of like a comply or explain type situation where as long as you're saying what you're doing, you don't actually need to be saying that you're doing anything particularly positive, if that makes sense. Um, so in terms of the one thing that regulators could do, I think one of the outcomes of COP26 is a phasing out of coal power. So a, an actual blanket ban on investment in, of certain types of um, of destructive uh, energy creation or, or other sort of socially or governance destructive behaviors in companies 
would probably have more impact than just reporting and disclosure standards. Thank you. I mean, we have come to the end of the hour, but we have one more question. Can, can we please just take that one? You know, rules are there to be broken, aren't they? So let's just crack on for an extra couple of minutes. Um, effectively, with so many stakeholders, I was just wondering where where's the driving force? Is it the client or the investor, or is it actually the the, the company or the, the portfolio manager? You know, who's who's actually you know the push pull? You know, who's actually you know, the driving force at the moment? Emika, I think that's probably for you as well, if you don't mind, from what you're hearing with the corporates. Um, so I, I think it's a combination of, well, actually, I think it's the regulatory driver on the investor. So more and more now, particularly institutional pension funds, are being asked to report on the climate risk within their portfolios. Um, and that is driving them to make more climate positive decisions and demand data and evidence from their underlying investments about their climate performance. So I think regulation on what investors do and investor behaviour is probably the biggest driver. Thank you. W would you agree, Mbali, or have you got a slightly different angle there? Um, no, I agree with that. Maybe the only thing just to add, um, you know, just from the, the questions around policy, um, government, uh, corporates, and, and as of course society at large, a nice document you could read is um, a document that was developed by the University of Cambridge. It's called Rewind the Economy. And it's a really useful way of, you know, looking at 10 interconnected steps um, that help you sustainable development goals and it looks at how finance, business and government can work together to achieve those goals. So yeah, maybe that could shed some light in terms of how you know we have that cyclical um, you know work towards progressing sustainability or ESG at large. Okay, thank thank you very much. So look let, let's let's wrap up. So first of all I'd like to thank the people who have joined me. So Marga, Mbali, James and Emiko, thank you very much for your time for, for attending this morning. You know, clearly as you've heard, Standard Bank, Melbourne Douglas, you know, this is very much our core focus. We have a range of solutions, products and services which we can help engage with it through corporates or private clients. Uh, when we send through the follow-up information after this meeting, we'll include a copy of the video. Uh, for those online, we'll also, as I said before, include a copy of Marga's book. But we'll also make sure that you have the contact details for people that you can get in touch with on a one-to-one -one basis if you would like to understand more about our range of services or indeed our products and services. With that, with it just being after 10 o'clock UK time, again, to the audience, it's a wet, windy day in Jersey, must be spring. Thank you very much for coming out, it's most appreciated. And for everybody joining online, again, we hope this arrangement of virtual hybrid has worked for you. Uh, we'd certainly value your feedback and we can then tailor our presentations going forward. With that, many thanks and I'll close the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>